Good evening, everybody, for our next game virtual online meetup. And we have none other than Sarah Edder joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's been we're a while. very excited to have you on here. We uh, see your stuff on Facebook, and you're always keeping busy. And obviously, we're on your. Uh, <laughs> on your list of stuff too. So oh, I see that's the stuff right. you're, you're bringing out for sure. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. a little bit of bio on Sarah, for those of you guys who don't know her. So Sarah is the owner and CEO of Sarah Edder Investments, a firm focused on multifamily and commercial acquisitions in emerging markets. Relatively new to the real estate game, Sarah left her role as an international professional athlete only two and a half years ago, which I'd like to hear more about, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and managed to raise over seven figures in that short time. She specializes in joint venture partnerships and has funded an entire portfolio using none of her own money. Sarah is incredibly passionate about coaching and helping others learn how to raise capital and is a strong voice for financial independence for women, which is awesome. Very, very, very Thank cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So just very quickly, tell us about your professional athlete. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, what, yeah. What's that all about? I get so many questions about that one. And I love talking about it because I love hearing about all the different backgrounds that investors have come from. Like, I feel like people would assume we come from finance backgrounds. And I feel like mm -hmm. every investor I know, none of us like really started with like a no. background in real estate. Right. Yeah. And I think that makes it so diverse. Like, I feel like you got like life skills and then you like fall into real estate. Right. Yeah. So I was actually, um, a professional equestrian. So I did show jumping with horses, That's like wild. not even like a normal sport. Like I was in like <laughs> the weird, crazy elite. <laughs> level. Do you ever like, despite, you know, now you haven't kind of shifted gears a little bit, do you still dabble and, and kind of recreationally? Um, so I hung on. Um, so I bought a horse, um, a few years back and he was supposed to be kind of like my Olympic hopeful and I bought him as like a baby horse and I was like training him, kind of bringing him along. And, uh, about a year, I guess it'd be a year and a half ago. Now I finally let him go. He was like my last horse in the roster. I just, I didn't have time for him and he was so talented. He needed to go somewhere else uh, he actually got sold to europe and he's now competing in spain which is wow. i watch him like a mom would watch like a child <laughs> i like follow his like career and everything it's pretty cool and, and I, I keep in touch with the owners um yeah. but i haven't sat on a horse for almost like two years now actually it's kind of mm -hmm. it's just so hard with like the portfolio but my goal is another year talk to my partner he's gonna let me have horses again so it's Ooh. a time consuming thing <laughs> I know, uh, I know Kaylee, she, uh, she used to show horses. No way. Like, yeah. Oh, so she's a huge horse fanatic. Actually, it was up until I think two and a half years ago, she also had a horse. And no as soon as we got kind of amalgamated into the real estate world, it would, just gets um, busy. Yeah. Just a little too much. So she actually, uh, sold her to someone, I think at a Nova Scotia no and it was way. still like a young girl who was just starting her path in, in, uh, in showing horses and they're like cleaning up right now supposedly so yeah. kaylee's the same way she, she kind of follows, follows along right yeah yeah we exactly. should uh joint venture on a horse together there you go there you go for sure <laughs> so um tell us a little bit about like what what got you into real estate yeah. kind of quite a shift right definitely um i think it's an the reason I'm so passionate about talking about my past is because I feel like this is a huge issue for a lot of professional athletes that like we don't often plan for the retirement phase of our athletic career, even though our coaches are like, hey, like someday you're going to age out, you're going to phase out, you have to have a backup plan. Um, I was supposed to go to like law school and everything. And like, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go to the Olympics and everything, which I, I didn't go. Um, I was short of going to the Olympics. Um, decided to get into this instead. But um, yeah, you know, everyone's telling me someday you're going to quit. Someday you're going to quit. Make sure, you know, you have a backup plan. And I was being the really driven person. I was like, I don't need a backup plan. It's fine. Well, Lo and behold, I'm 27 and I actually did decide to officially quit. Um, and I honestly had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, I had been competing professionally or semi-professionally, at least at the provincial level, since I was 12 years old. So you think how many years I dedicated to this? Like, it's, it's like, like a way of life at that point. Yeah. And it's like the, the time frame most adults spend in a career. So like, I, I already knew what it was like to have a lifelong career as like a very young person. So I was like, I had a business degree. That was my parents. One thing they made me go to university, got a business degree. So at least I had, I did have some background in like finance and economics. Um, 
And I, I took the first job that provided me the flexibility to, cause I saw a couple horses at the time. I wouldn't let them all go. I, I need to be able to ride and like go to my farm. I just wanted like decent money, a contract. I, I was just like testing the corporate waters. Mm -hmm. And the first job that allowed me flexibility actually happened to be with a property management company because they weren't your standard nine to five hours. And I thought, Oh, okay, whatever, real estate, I can do that, that's fine. No, I didn't really ever think of this being a career, it was just temporary. And uh, started working for the PM company and it took me no more than a couple months. And I just knew like, this is where I wanted to be more. I, I saw them doing some investment stuff on the side and I'm, oh, gosh, the tenants, maybe not so much. That wasn't like as much of the fun <laughs> part, but uh, yeah, I was just really, really driven. And I saw the financial freedom they created for themselves and the life they were living. And I was like, this is amazing. I want this. I love it. And yeah. you know, I, I think a very interesting point, especially from your bio is that line where um, you funded an entire portfolio <laughs> using none of your own money. And I think that's a key thing. The, yeah. the biggest objection we get, and I'm sure you get it all the time, like, oh, everything's too expensive. I don't have any money. I can't yeah. do this. You know? Can't qualify. If, yeah, yeah, can't qualify because I'm self-employed. Like, like we ran into those <laughs> issues too, right? Um, yeah. But the only way to overcome them is to have an ability to raise capital. And I think this is why this is such a hot That's topic funny. amongst amongst real estate investors, especially nowadays where property values are just skyrocketing the way they are. All yeah. the money doesn't get into it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think like, I mean, obviously, like I do a lot of coaching around this because this is like something people like really like struggle with with real estate is like it's the mindset that like you have to be a millionaire in order to invest that you have to have all this like excess capital. And when I first started, I mean, like I was some poor horse kid that like had spent all my money on like a bunch of horses and like a farm like I had nothing to my name. And I'm just like one of those people like call it the determination I learned over the years of like being a competitive athlete. But I was like, okay, like, here's a solution. I learned about this whole concept of JVs. My uh, employer actually encouraged me to join rain, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So the real estate investment network, and I started going to things and they were bantering on this word joint ventures. And I was like, okay, so I'm like, tell it to me straight. You're saying that I can actually buy a property with a partner. I'm gonna have to work for it but I don't have to put down any of my own cash. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. This is a thing. So once I was able to like wrap my mind around, I was like, why don't, why doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> like, it seems like a no brainer. Right. So then I just, you know, I, I did spend some time educating myself and, you know, I decided, okay, if I'm going to be an expert, I, I need to be an expert. And so I stayed with the property management company for probably like a year and a half. So like, I really did gain a lot of experience. I did inspections on large commercial buildings with people. I was like the front man going to like the landlord tenant board for like kind of bad tenants and serve the notices, learn the systems. Um, so I felt like I was like savvy enough. I'd never owned real estate in my life, but I figured, you know, that piece I can kind of learn from everyone else. And um, I don't think I'd be where I am today without that ability. You know, it's, it's definitely changed my life for the better. And I think it's a skill it gets you a lot of places, like not just real estate, but on a lot of things. You know, I think about these, uh, these, you know, startup companies that are going and pitching yeah. or even if, you know, that the hit shows like the dragon den and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, really always like no angel investors. Yeah. yeah, except you're dealing with uh, sometimes, you know, people that just aren't satisfied with typical savings, which yeah. I think is the, what we get a lot of gratification from is the returns we can get. You, you take an average Absolutely. person who's got mutual funds and that's the only thing that they've ever thought of for their entire lives yeah. as, a, as a reasonable investment. And then you show them the returns they're making on their portfolio and their like jaw hits the floor. Like that's a good feeling in my opinion. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's so many savvy investors out there or just like business people that like they understand the value of real estate and they understand like they want to diversify. Like you said, like they probably already own some stocks and mutual funds and whatever, mm -hmm. but I mean, and they've always been enticed by the idea of, of real estate, but all they know is pre-construction condos yeah. in like downtown. Yeah. They don't understand multifamily, <laughs> which is like my specialty. And so the idea of them owning a five plex in Hamilton, it's like, Oh God, like I don't want to even like wrap my head around that. And so that's why I, you know, us as like the working partner is like, it's a perfect fit for sure. And uh, just so everyone knows, we are going to be putting a link below uh, for how to get in touch with Sarah because she Thank does you. do coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. We have actually experienced some of the clients who have worked with us on the real estate side oh, that's who right, yeah. we coach with now. So 
Uh, she does a wonderful job. We can vouch for her and <laughs> the, the breadth of experience. So um, now I know that you've put together uh, uh, a little bit of a slide presentation. I have some questions as well, but I'm just wondering if your slides might actually touch on those. Sure. So absolutely. How about you jump into your um, your slides and kind of walk us through? As yeah. everyone knows, today's topic is obviously raising capital, Definitely. and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we want to want to learn as much as we can in this short amount let's of time. Sounds good. Do you want me to just share my screen? Yeah, sure thing. I okay, think I, you it. can share your screen. I can still see you somehow, but we'll, oh, we'll see perfect. how this works. We'll see how it happens. Okay. Oh, okay, we're gonna try this and see what happens. All righty, can see we see? You here. Can you still see me? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can see you too, perfect. Fantastic. So I probably won't go through like the whole presentation because it, it's a bit long, but yeah. I definitely just wanted to share a little bit. I know, um, I do specialize obviously in raising capital, but mostly um, through social media. So, um, I, you know, you're talking about me being passionate about helping like women with financial freedom. Um, I also am really passionate about millennials owning houses. Um, I just, I hate those statistics that the boomers tell us like millennials will never own houses and work like so like irresponsible with money and everything. Yeah. Uh, I'm really passionate about kind of kicking that, that norm. So I'll share with you guys a little bit about social media and like how, you know, a lot of people think that you have to be a millionaire, you have to have a huge portfolio in order to raise capital. And people come to me sometimes and I'm like, Sarah, I only own like one or two rental properties. I'm not good enough to raise capital. I'm not good enough to have JVs. Um, so we're going to go over that today. Like you don't have to be, you know, uh, a huge multi-million dollar portfolio owner in order for people to trust you um, and to raise real estate. So, or a capital for real estate. And the whole thing that I like to focus on is this, you know, idea of like thinking outside the box. A lot of people think about raising capital in like a very traditional sense. And it's this idea that, you know, we're millennials, we're smart, we can, you know, use social. Um, it's not just like this fixed idea that, so-and-so puts down X amount of dollars and you just have to do this. You know, there's lots of different creative ways that we can work with individuals. And even like how we find capital, um, you know, a lot of it used to be meeting in, you know, networking clubs and old boys clubs and things like that. It's just not the case anymore, you know, especially during COVID, everyone's probably thinking, well, Sarah, how did you raise capital during COVID? How did, you know, you keep uh, working with JVs? And you know what? I actually raised more capital than ever during COVID. Um, and it was because I was behind my computer so much. I was networking, I was talking to people, I was doing Zoom calls and webinars. And it actually just proved that like, you don't necessarily have to be physically in a room with someone um, to necessarily interact with them and, and raise capital. And there's tons of possibility. I mean, think about it. When you're posting on social, when you're you know interacting with people on the internet, you're getting access to thousands of people interested in like what you have to say, as opposed to networking groups where you may interact with like one, two, maybe three people, and you can never really guarantee that they're interested um, in JVing. So I, I, I do love your bringing up this point, because I think that a lot of the like the old timers that like, for instance, I learned to raise capital from mm -hmm. in the real estate world, they all brought up the idea of like, you know, go to networking events. And that's kind of what we've done the meetings. Yeah, yeah. Go to the meetings. And yeah. it was funny, I was talking to Mark Loeffler a little while ago and he oh, said yeah. that if you wanna find the big whales, you'll never find them at the meetings. Cause and why would they go? Kind of concept, exactly, right? Yeah, it's like they're already advanced, yeah. savvy people. They don't need to go to these networking events. You got it. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're bringing this up, it's interesting. Sorry, keep going. No, no, please interrupt, it's good. That's a great point. Um, and you know, when I've talked to other mentors of my own, when we talk about like, you know, where do we find these people? Oftentimes it's like, okay, well, if you're gonna go after people with high earning power and you know, they have good jobs and they're in the corporate settings, it's like, where are they hanging out? And you know, it's other types of networking groups, like entrepreneurial groups, um, charity events you know other things like you have to kind of get inside their their head and figure out where they would hang out it's probably not uh networking groups um i know he got it already shared a little bit about my uh you know background and everything so i won't go through this but 
or this is basically my why for like why I started, you know, with JVs. I didn't really have a choice. I had a widowed mom, debts. I was really broke in my early 20s, bad credit. So I didn't have a lot of options, which is actually kind of good in a way. You know, sometimes that's like the catalyst that you need. Um, and I was able to quit my full-time job and, you know, become a full-time investor in less than a year. So it's definitely doable, you know, if you guys really want this. And how long ago was this? Just so people know. Just a little over three years now. So three years ago, it took you one year to quit the corporate job and be yeah. independent and have financial freedom. Yeah. One year, folks. Yeah. And I mean, when we say financial freedom, I mean, like, I was able to, like, replace my corporate income, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, since then, like, we've grown, like, exponentially. And that's why I tell people, you know, like, focus on, like, the small things first. Like, if you're making $6,000 a month, focus on that. Like, what do you need to do to make $6,000 a month? Maybe you do some flips, some wholesales, a couple, like, student rentals. Like, you know, focus on the the shorter term like tangible stuff and then you can kind of focus on the bigger stuff like i don't love my like small properties to be honest like i love my commercial properties and my apartments and stuff like that but i knew that like i'd never be able to get there if i was always kind of stuck to like the nine to five grind so i did some stuff i didn't love as much like flips and wholesales and some smaller like student rentals and stuff to start so that I could quit my job and survive. And then I kind of like phased into the stuff I was more interested in doing. So yeah, you gotta be strategic. A hundred percent. It was actually one of my questions is currently right now with all the different strategies that exist, what is your preferred method? That's a great question. So I think like, I mean, definitely like the burr strategy with multifamily. Um, I always keep coming back to it. You know, obviously it's like a longer term strategy and I do some flips on the side for like capital generation and things like that and some developments. Um, but definitely like doing the burrs on those multis, it's so, I don't know, I love everything about it. Even like dealing with the tenants, some people think it's like, oh, it's the worst and everything. But um, I don't know, I like it. I, I definitely find like my groove in that that zone. And I feel like it's like the perfect mix between cash flow and like a really stable like appreciating asset for sure. Hundred percent, hundred percent. We're in the same boat too. I, like the burst yeah. rash, you just can't go wrong with it. No, nope. exactly. Anytime you can, you know, force appreciation, recycle your cash, keep doing it. I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, it is challenging. You know, you get better at it as you go, but yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, like, it, it definitely wasn't like a perfectly linear journey by any means i'm in mistakes i you know started off small kind of was in like a bunch of different markets i learned really quickly early on to like niche in a market like pick one market pick one type of strategy that really assisted with my acceleration um and i just got everywhere really fast i started to kind of hear you know worked on my education. I went on YouTube, went on podcasts. I just tried to get seen by as many people as humanly possible um, to try to just build this network and try to get seen by as many JVs as possible. Um, honestly, like that's like the best um, strategy you can choose. Um, it's kind of this idea. A lot of people don't like JVs. You know, you're splitting profits. You're working with partners. It can seem really risky, but you're options are to stay stuck you know with like the limited financing capabilities you have on your own or take a little bit of a risk you can see jvs more as a stepping stone as like the ultimate destination and that's realistically how i look at my jvs absolutely one uh, one key element that really changed my mindset around joint ventures was mm -hmm. attraction versus pursuit and right. i think a lot of people that yeah. that get frustrated especially with this whole process of raising <laughs> capital and get stuck and hit those walls is that they're pursuing it and it almost yeah. comes across as i know needy sounds a little bit hard no but, but yeah like that kind of like desperate for capital yeah. like yeah. I, I always get a kick out of it you know like at these networking events people come to the front of the room and they're like hi my name's joe and i need a million bucks and you'll find me over at the corner of the room just come talk <laughs> to me i need a million i've got a property you know like i, I just find it it's sometimes uh, comical versus when you can attract it based on the things that you're mm -hmm. doing. And that's, I, I think a lot of people get stuck on that idea too, because mm -hmm. with attraction, how do you attract people without having a proven track record? Right? Absolutely. So these that's are a, some of the challenges. No, it's such an awesome question. Like I get asked that all the time. They're like, Sarah, I have no properties. I have no track record. Like, how do I 
prove to people that like I have a reputation, like what am I going to show if I'm posting on Facebook and everything? Um, so you know what I always encourage people to do is like focus on the strengths that you do have, which, okay, if your strengths are not that, okay, I've done this a million times and I have a portfolio, what else are you doing in real estate? And that's why I encourage people that if they're not doing things in real estate, they should be, whether that's shadowing people on jobs, getting a mentor, being involved with other people's like, I don't know, like flips, multis, getting into property management, getting into construction, getting into something that can be enough of an edge for a JV partner to say, you know what, I'll take a chance on you. And that's what happened with me because of my property management experience. I didn't have property buying experience, but they were like, you know what, whatever we buy, we're pretty confident. Like Sarah at least can handle the tenants can choose good ones. And she knows how to run a building. So that's kind of how I got my like edge, you know, in. So, you know, for those of you that are thinking, crap, like, what do I bring to the table? That should be the question you ask yourself, you know, is like, what can you bring to a table um, that doesn't necessarily just have to be a bunch of properties in your portfolio? Yeah, no, absolutely. And another thing that I find that uh, a lot of people get very intimidated by is Mm -hmm. actually it's twofold. One is like, let's say finally I I find a joint venture partner and they're willing Mm -hmm. to say, okay, yeah, we'll give you $250,000. Now what do I do with that money? This person's expecting me to create a return for them. And then the second part is like, I've never managed construction before. How am I supposed to go manage a burr project if I don't have the experience, I don't have the know-how doing this, right? Yeah. So these are some of the hurdles. Um, How did you get involved in understanding and wrapping your head around construction processes? such a great question that's another one I get asked so often by students and like that one's a little tougher because I think like without actual experience the construction piece is tough like unless you've walked around job sites and walked around a bunch of properties um I mean it's super tough to be able to look at something and go like okay no like we're going to do quartz countertops here we're going to change this layout and you know everything like that um the best thing I can say is like in the beginning I looked at a ton of properties. Um, even if I knew I wasn't going to buy them, I showed up to so many open houses. I just got familiar with like houses, if that makes sense. Like, I know that Mm -hmm. sounds weird, but like, I just need to get familiar with like the layouts and like what, how, like the mechanics of the building and stuff. Like, you know, you have to understand at least to some degree about the HVAC and electrical and be able to spot potential issues and things like that. Um, and I used to pay, um, a contractor to come with me during walkthroughs. And so we would go through walkthroughs of like properties I was like looking at and he would like explain stuff about like knob and tube and like foundation stuff and whatever. And so I think that's really like one of the only ways you can really like go shadow people on job sites. If they'll let you go to people's like, you know, construction projects halfway through, check stuff out, ask questions, join groups. Like, you know, you really just have to kind of like try to like immerse yourself as much as you can. Um, That being said, I will admit, like I am not a renovation expert, which might shock like some people, but I'm really not. Like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I leave to my team. And I think that that is also a good point is, if you are kind of like uncertain about timelines and costing and all that kind of stuff, you need to get yourself a really trusted GC. Like don't try to take your first project on by yourself and subcontract out like the electrical and the drywall and everything. Like you might be better off to go with like a really experienced like general contractor to start. You're going to pay more money for it, but at least like he can actually teach you a thing or two like throughout the process as well. Yeah. I I often recommend to people the same thing. It's like, how do I know? But, Practically speaking, a lot of these first-time investors are going to go see like 50 houses and you can't yeah. bring the contractor along with you to 50 To everyone, houses. yeah. Yeah, but a key component we find is with general contractors, which is 100% the best way to do it. I think it's really the only way to do it is to get a contractor, but find a general contractor who understands investment properties. Yes. There's a big yes. change there too because <laughs> we, uh, we just uh, were talking with uh, uh, friends of ours and they got quoted twenty thousand and sixteen thousand dollars from two different contractors for a bathroom what? renovation. Oh my in, gosh! In a uh, in like a rental type property, what? I mean sixteen thousand dollars is like what I would consider like a multi million dollar home renovation for a bathroom. And two yeah. separate contractors quoted them like within the same price point, and they were going to sign off because they're like, "Oh, well, sixteen grand is better than 20. And Ooh, like, and it should be like, like five. Stop. 
stop. So anyway, thank the Lord. But I, I digress. <laughs> no, not a problem. No, I think that's such a great question. I think, uh, yeah, construction, it can be tough, like, especially if it's not like your wheelhouse. But yeah, we use GCs for everything. And people are like, oh, like, Sarah, it makes your, you know, construction projects a little more expensive. Um, but you know what, all of our contractors, like, they've done permits before, they've done duplex, triplex, fourplex conversions, they're experienced with commercial properties. And so it'd be silly, like, not to utilize like their expertise, because like, you know, we have to stay in our lane as JV partners. Like I'm technically, my job should be sourcing out deals, putting together contracts, raising the capital. I shouldn't be the one nitty gritty deciding like what type of like wiring do we use here and like whatever. It would be like a waste of our time essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I'll kind of skim through this part since you guys kind of know what a joint venture is. I mean, traditionally, obviously, we do kind of like this idea of like a 50-50 split where we're both bringing something of equal value to the table um, in a real estate transaction. Um, that pretty much just means typically um, one investor is bringing the down payment and the financing and one partner is the working partner handling the construction, the tenanting and all the kind of day to day activities in that house. Um, but nowadays, it's kind of like a little interesting how JVs I've seen morph even the past few years. We have higher home prices, more competitive bidding situations, higher stress tests, higher debt. And so sometimes it's actually hard to find um, JV partners that have both capital and mortgage financing. Um, and sometimes people are getting capped out of their mortgages and like how much they can qualify for and things like that. So, you know, don't be shy in getting creative, you know, when it comes to structuring joint ventures too, people want this idea of like pooling of resources and complementary roles. And um, I'm not so strict with my GVs that I think like everybody has to have like $200,000 and, you know, a certain amount of qualification. Um, I can usually find situations that work for different JVs in different applications. And if someone wants to give me free money, I'm not going to say no, <laughs> you know, um, I'll try to find a way that we can work together towards like, you know, a mutually satisfactory uh, relationship. On that question, actually, if sure. for like, let's say a typical Burr project, let's say yeah. you need um, between renovations and the down payment and holding the mortgage, you need $250,000 yeah. for this. Would you ever split that up? Whereas you're the 50% uh, joint venture, like real estate expert. And would you do three different partners, let's say, and divvy those up? I try not to with the smaller properties because my fear is always that like, we're not going to have enough like spread for like three partners. But if it's like a brother and sister, like a family member and like they want to kind of split it up, I have done that before. Um, typically if people come to me and they're like, Hey, I'm kind of like limited on my budget right now. And I only have like X amount to spend. Um, what we do is we actually try to put those individuals into our larger buildings, like a sixplex or a tenplex or something. Because in that situation, there's usually more than enough cash flow to go around. And they can usually supplement maybe a couple other investors. And you know, the splits kind of make more sense mm -hmm. um, from a cash flow perspective. Or we might do some private lending with them, do a couple flip projects, help them generate some extra capital so that they are kind of ready maybe next year to do like a duplex conversion with us or something. So That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it we gives, get creative. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, for sure. I think it's extremely valuable too. Like we've often run into that problem as well. Like someone comes to us like, Alex, we have 50 grand and we'd like to partner with We're you. Stuck. And yeah. I feel terrible being like, you know, the, with the property values that we're dealing with, the yeah. construction values of a lot of our projects, like it, it doesn't do a lot for us, but definitely with the higher caliber properties, you can then pull the resource together. It makes more sense. Makes more now sense, Sam. It, in that case scenario, let's say you have a distribution of five partners, just for example, you're the yeah. real estate expert, five partner, 10% each for the 50% yeah. side. With the cash flow that a property is generating, do you guys pool that and then distribute it at the end of the year? Or yeah. how do you guys typically do it? Yeah. Yeah, that's 100% because it gets kind of like messy. Um, some investors aren't like a huge fan of that structure because they like the idea of like monthly passive income. Um, but that's the way it works on some of like these larger buildings, you know, like the acquisition price point is usually quite high. And then, you know, we factor in renovation costs and tenant turnover. And like, there's a lot of instability in those first like couple of years with like those big buildings. So typically, we kind of say, hey, 
you know, first two, maybe three years, it's going to be a bit unstable. We're going to do kind of like annual payouts. And then after like we've kind of turned over a bunch of tenants and we have a bit more like income stability, then we'll usually move towards like quarterly payouts. That's a much better word than what I use. You use instability. And that sounds so like, I get it. I always call it the simmering period. Oh yeah. Uh, that's property a good is word. simmering and it's just like hot. It's like, we got to wait a year or two because there's just stuff happening. Like, brand, like we have a brand new re renovation we just did on Garfield Avenue in Hamilton. Okay. And like yeah. brand new plumbing, electrical, like fax, wow. it's beautiful. Top yeah. of the line. And the first thing the, the tenant does is puts a plug in and then sparks shoot out of the, the electrical socket. And it's like, these is what I mean when I say it's, it's simmering. Things need to kind of, <laughs> well, they got to break it settled. in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And, you know, people sometimes forget about that, that like, especially when you're doing like JV properties, you have like money coming in and refinances happen and everything that really, I mean, by the time you refinance, you pull out all that equity and you have tenants and like you said, kind of like little issues like in the house. I mean, it takes some time to like get consistent cash flow coming in, um, you know, kind of start to pay down some of the extra equity you took out and everything. So yeah, those first couple of years are always a bit interesting. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Okay. So I guess I will talk to you guys probably about what you're wanting to hear about, which is branding. Uh, it's kind of my specialty. I did study marketing in university. So I really enjoy this part about raising capital. And, you know, I want you guys to think about this as like, the idea of like raising capital, and I think like Alex said it so well, that this is not the time when you need to be chasing people for capital. You want to create an experience. You want your brand online to be this like inviting space where someone wants to come and says, yes, like, you know, I get what this person is doing. I enjoy this vibe that they have going on. And I'm interested in reaching out to them. Um, I can't remember the last time I actively solicited um, for JV partners, I'm at a point where like, they kind of come to me, they see what I'm doing. And they like, you know, what I'm doing with my projects and everything. Um, it becomes less of a struggle when you stop chasing, believe it or not. And this whole idea of the importance of branding is so so important. I know, Alex, you guys have a pretty good brand. I saw your new building. It looks beautiful, by the Thank way. You. Thank you. <laughs> so they get what branding is about. And it, it's so true that you know, whether you are just a small investor getting started and you just have a couple of properties here and there, you still need a website. You guys still need business cards. You need a logo. You need a name. Um, you need people to be able to find you easily online. This allows you to set expectations with your people. So when they see your branding, they can recognize you. They trust you. It's this idea that when they interact with you, they know exactly what they're going to get. It's like, when you buy an Apple iPhone, when you open that box, it's like, you know exactly like what's gonna be in there and you're excited and you trust it. You're just you're so stoked for this like new phone. That's what you want people to feel when they're ready to invest with you. You know, that they're on your wavelength, that they trust, know, and like you. Um, so that's a really, really important thing to note. I know it's not fun <laughs> drafting up, you know, a website and business cards and stuff, but I think it's a really, really important component. Um, I love this slide. People are like, oh, what are you talking about? Nobody cares about your deals. <laughs> I hate to break it to you guys, but it's so true. They really, really need to like and trust you as a person. Um, realistically, I mean, even like technically Alex and I compete in like the same market sort of. Um, and you might think, okay, well, like why does someone go with Alex versus me versus, you know, the dozens of other investors that are in like the golden horseshoe. Um, and it's the idea that we all bring something a little different to the table. And what they like about me might be a little different than like what they like about Alex, for example. And so if they don't get to like and know you and trust you in your brand online, you're going to make it really hard for them to make a decision. And often um, my clients that come to me, um, always pick something that they feel like resonated with them. Like, oh, I saw your post where you shared this little tidbit or you, I saw you on this video and you talked about this. It really spoke to me. It really made me feel like I, I understood you and I liked, you know, what you had to say. Um, I like, really don't underestimate how much people need to like you to give you money. It's a lot less about the numbers and the deals than you think. A hundred and ten percent. Like you couldn't have said it better. It's so funny. <laughs> you see the line, like they need to like and trust you as a person written yeah. clearly. And 
it comes up in every single book business kind of related book that you see out there i don't know like if you know the ultimate sales machine book oh yeah that's a good one yeah people do business with people that they know like and trust and it's it's, it's the if you don't have like whether whether it's real estate or selling you know air handling units to people like you know everyone's been had that feeling of that greasy salesperson who's trying to to sell and they call it in actually the real estate agent world they call it commission breath right? oh yeah <laughs> and, and it's the same kind of thing it's it fundamentally in sales sales like can that. become really fun when you don't have to try so hard because you're naturally just providing value to people and when you provide sense. value to people, you exude trust and you exude likability, in my opinion, Absolutely. as long as you're passionate about what you do. So I, Definitely. I, a great point to bring up and it's very, very important. Yep. No, thank you for bringing that up. I, I appreciate that. It's, uh, yeah, one of those things that people just get so focused in. I, I work with some students that um, they're like engineers or like in finance and they're very like um, numbers oriented. And what they'll say to me is like, Sarah, are you saying I have to learn small talk? I hate small talk. And I'm like, yeah, like that's your weakness. I'm like, you can run spreadsheets all day long, but until you learn how to connect on more of a personal level with an individual, your spreadsheets will be meaningless. So, yeah. so I kind of already chatted a little bit about this, but I think it's like really important that you guys pick a niche. Some people think that they're like missing out on opportunities by doing that. And you're like, oh, like, why would I want to invest in Hamilton? Everyone invests in Hamilton. It's such a saturated, you know, hot market. But yet we're still buying deals in Hamilton and finding off market opportunities. And so, you know, there is the idea that rather than spread your focus everywhere, you might be missing out on deals that are actually right under your nose by taking your focus away. So I would really recommend like, especially when you guys are first starting, if you are trying to differentiate yourself from all of the other JV partners out there, you want to be picking a specific niche. That's a type of property too, and a specific market, whether that's flips, conversions, multifamily, rent to own, whatever the case is, pick one, stick with it. You can always grow more later, but otherwise people are going to get very like muddled about what it is you're actually doing. Um, and you need to also be really um, consistent with your core values. Again, it's like what separates me from a bunch of other JVs. It's not the types of deals I'm doing. It's how I present myself and the things that I talk about. So I talk about my story. I show people that, you know, idea we've been talking about a lot all session is, you know, show, don't tell. Don't tell people they need to invest with you. Show them why you're a good bet, essentially. I kind of put this picture in here. This is actually when we were on vacation. And it's this idea that like we're showing a story about like what can be accomplished with real estate investing, not forcing them to give us money. Um, and yeah, like I said, like also this like idea of like consistent messaging. Um, I see a lot of people get confused because they're not sure what to post on social media. And so they'll post one thing one day and one thing another day, and they get really like jumbled up on all the different platforms. And that's why you need to spend time finding your niche, finding your values, figuring out who you want your brand and what you want your brand to say, because otherwise people are going to get so confused. You're going to be a different person on your YouTube channel than you are on Instagram. And then all of a sudden it just falls apart and people don't enjoy watching your content. So you need to stay very, very consistent. Pick one type of branding and just stick with it across all the different channels. Funny enough, it actually makes be like makes your life easier. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, I, I think that uh, people associate the business and growth within the business is if it's not complex, if I'm not like stressed all the time and I, I can get stressed out, <laughs> right. By going in multiple different directions. But when yeah. I look at our most profitable deals, they've always been the ones that are right in my wheelhouse of where I'm comfortable, where I walk in a property in 20 seconds flat. You I just know. know. Do or not, right. Yeah. And that's, you know, people are, are, are sometimes they overcomplicate the idea of it. So great point. Great point. Absolutely. No. And it's such a good thing to, to talk about because some people are like, well, I just heard a podcast on land development and now I want to do lot severance and I want to do this and I want to do that. And I think it's like, it's just human nature to want to kind of chase after like get rich quick schemes. And I think we all know that like the best avenues of real estate are actually, unfortunately, the boring long-term 
really plain vanilla type of deals. Those are the ones that are going to pay off the longest in the long run. So Don Campbell from rain actually said that he said, I yes. want a boring real estate portfolio. Just boring. Yeah. If my real estate portfolio was exciting. Then I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> That's exactly it. I never want to feel that like where I'm like, well, mind you, sometimes with the burrs, it can get a little yeah. stressful. Like I know oh, just yeah. before this call, Alex <laughs> and I were talking about appraisals and things that have been going on because of yeah. COVID. Um, but that's probably the most excitement I want to have in my portfolio. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So just kind of like an overview if you guys wanted to see what my branding physically looks like. Obviously the content has to be there too, but you can see like it's very like consistent. I spent a lot of time like thinking about like, okay, what colors do I want? I know this guy, this sound like my sound frivolous to you guys, but like realistically, this stuff is important. I want people when they look at my business cards and then they go to my website and then they see my social media to feel like it is a consistent experience. I want them to feel like I'm saying the same things again and again, because um, and Alex will probably know this from being um, a real estate agent that oftentimes conversions with clients happen over multiple exposure. And sometimes it happens subconsciously without them realizing it. So if you are changing up your messaging a lot, it becomes very difficult for people to subconsciously um, kind of like hang on to things that they're like absorbing from watching your content. But if you have a very consistent experience, they'll start to like you and follow you more without them even realizing it. So definitely like take time, like, coordinate your colors, get a good logo, make sure your messaging stays on point. Um, otherwise, it's going to be really hard for people to just like naturally and organically want to follow you. See, uh, on, uh, on that note, your social media was one of the first ones I've ever seen, where your Instagram is so neatly laid out, that it actually like, it looks, and I, I, don't, I don't know if you're a very organized person or not, but you look and you come across as very organized because of it. I'm like, the Thank patterns you. are so perfectly all set up. It's, anyway, yeah. I'm just a mismatch of all kinds of stuff on my <laughs> Instagram. You know, and, and to be perfectly honest, I'm organized, but I'm also lazy. And so when you said about like trying to make your life easy on social, I'll give you guys a great tip. I pick every other day a type of post and then I stick with it consistently. So on my grid, it looks super clean and super nice but really it's just because i don't want to have to think of like new content like every single day so one day i might do like a, a quote on like a white background and then the next i show a property and then it'll be another quote on a white background and then like i just like alternate day after day and it actually takes the pressure off of me to think about what i need to post that day brilliant brilliant oh it's working yeah thank you see and that's like something right it's like you know the idea that you know someone seeing your page like something so frivolous and so small like how organized my page looks automatically makes someone go huh like she must be a pretty organized person well that's like a really good feature that you would want in a jv partner right someone that looks um professional and i always reiterate this to people when they complain about needing to have a website and a logo is i say like you know it's a small price to pay for someone believing that you're a professional because someone will be impressed by that website. Someone will say, wow, like this person took the time to design these like beautiful cards. They must take themselves and their business seriously. And I mean, that's really something you want to, you know, continue to foster in your JVs when they see your stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I probably don't have to like reiterate for you guys about the power of social media. I mean, it, it really just is such a great place to network with uh, people. You know, the algorithms you can use on Facebook, leveraging your time to get in front of more people at once. Um, it really, really is a much better use of your time. Um, something I want to touch on briefly is this idea of creating an avatar. Um, some people come to me and they're like, well, I don't know where to find JV, Sarah. I don't know who my JV should be. And I think this is a really good exercise for people is to actually sit down and think, okay, who should my avatar look like? And you can name them, like name them like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Like, I don't know, whatever helps you like conceptualize them. It's this idea that you want to understand who are they, where do they hang out? What is their income like? What is their lifestyle? The more that you can get into like Mr. and Mrs. Smith's heads, the more you can really start to tailor your messaging, understand where to find them, how to talk to them, how to present to them. Because if you truly start to understand their wants, their fears, their needs, like what matters to them, then you guys are talking apples to apples when you're pitching a deal to them. If you are talking 
about stuff that like has no relevance to their lives, then um, they're not gonna listen. And like the perfect example is when people start to talk about lots of like ROI and cash on cash numbers with their investors. And when I'm training people, I always say, okay, instead of talking about like a 35% annual ROI, which literally they have no basis, they have no point of reference for what that means, talk to them in terms that like actually matter to them. So let's say that $600 a month in cash flow. What could that $600 a month in cash flow mean for them? Does that mean they can send Katie to like that private school they want to send her to? Does that mean they could buy that boat for their cottage that they've been wanting to? Maybe that means they can take that like vacation to Aruba that they've been planning. Like talk to them like in their terms and like actually understand what makes them tick. Um, and that's going to go way further on like your sales pitches when you're talking to people. I love it. I yeah. love it. Sales 101 right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is just kind of like a brief rundown for you guys, but um, this is definitely something that people, again, struggle with. Like, what platforms should I be on? Um, realistically, you guys don't have to be on every single platform. And in fact, I don't encourage it. You get overwhelmed very, very quickly. Um, I think realistically, you want to pick like two, maybe three. Um, start with two. Um, get really good at them. Be active on them every day. Um, it's better to be active on one or two than to be on three and very like inactive. Um, and each of them kind of like do something a little different. So you want to make sure that like whatever channels you are using, um, you're utilizing them in the way that they were meant to be used. So like YouTube, for example, that wasn't meant for short impromptu videos. YouTube was designed for like in-depth how-to videos, high video quality, good editing. You know, so if you're gonna do stuff on YouTube, be prepared to spend a bit of time and money on, you know, proper editing and videography. Facebook, I think people should have regardless, even if you don't have a personal profile on Facebook, um, it is the most widely used app in the world. There are billions of people on Facebook. They have besides Google, the most amount of information, creepily enough, on us, um, they know what you clicked on, when you clicked on it, when you like something, they even know your demographic data, like how much income you've earned, what jobs you're at, like, if Facebook knows everything about you. And as weird as it is, we can also use that to our benefit in the idea of like Facebook ads and promotion. Because you know what, we might as well use the data to our advantage. And if we know what our avatar is, and we know what kind of you know uh, demographics we need to attract. Facebook has all that data on file that we can utilize. So I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, and plus, guys, if people are googling you online, if you don't have a business Facebook profile and people cannot find you, um, you've already lost credibility in their eyes. You need at least a website, like a Google My Business, and a Facebook business page. Those are like non-negotiable. If people can't find you, they will instantly think, I I'm sure you've done it. You look up a place to get your car detailed. If they don't have a website, you're like, who are these people? Are they even part of the 21st century? <laughs> like, yeah, <exactly>. right? <laughs> they just lose credibility. Like anyone who's anyone has a website and a Facebook business page, right? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. I mean, yeah. and you know, like, uh, I know a lot of people might be weirded out by that whole thing, but Facebook, Google, all these platforms, they, yeah. they run and operate based off of the user's experience. So mm -hmm. despite, Absolutely. I kind of, like, I don't delve into any sort of secret service kind of stuff. So, like really, I don't have any secrets here. If I click on like, you know, what's the best power tool and a power tool comes, ad comes up on Facebook. Oh, I'm yeah, actually yeah. okay with that. Cause I'm like, yeah, I was kind of looking for power tools anyway. So now you get it, a bunch of ads. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's a, uh, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of, you know, even today yeah. I'm looking for paving contractors and nice. there's, a whole list of paving contractors and the yellow pages has like four or five and i'm like i'm like to click on those guys nice no website no nothing right yeah, yeah yeah that's so funny yeah and then all of a sudden you're just kind of like you'll likely go with the guy who has the website and the google reviews because they just seem more professional and more credible right yep 100 yeah, percent. absolutely that's such a great point yeah and I mean, Instagram is definitely now Facebook purchased Instagram for those of you guys that don't know. So um, in this is kind of like an aside, but for those of you wanting to save time on social, the cool part is like you can actually connect your Facebook and your Instagram profiles now. So um, rather than create a bunch of content every single day, um, you can actually share content between like if you post on 
on Instagram, you can post on Facebook. If you post on Facebook, you can actually share it to Instagram. Um, so that's how you can save like a bit of time. So I highly recommend if you're going to have a Facebook, you know, page, might as well get Instagram as well and kind of spread out the content. Um, and Instagram is becoming really popular because it's become more of like the behind the scenes platform. So people like that they can tune in and kind of see little clips and snippets and videos of like your renovation projects or what you're working on that day or just even like your house and what's going on in your life. It's kind of weird. I mean, you choose how much you actually want to share with the world, but um, it's definitely, um, I actually feel like I get more potential JV leads from Instagram than Facebook because really? people are very engaged in Instagram where I feel like Facebook is something people do when they're bored and they just kind of like scroll through. But Instagram is much more, it was designed to be engaging and you click and you like and, and share and stuff. Right. So I feel like people like get really involved in my like day to day life on Instagram. And so when I have a deal that comes up and I'm like, Oh, look, I just bought a new deal. I almost always have like at least one or two people that message me immediately being like, Oh my God, I love this deal. Sarah, can we talk about partnering? <laughs> so Instagram is kind of like the new, the new Facebook. I love it. It's fantastic. Yeah. We, uh, we do a lot of ours, uh, mainly from networking and mainly from actually Facebook. Now that we're starting to promote a lot of stuff, we haven't got any sort of bites on Instagram yet, but Facebook's been a, a really, really big one for us. Cause of course you can mm -hmm. add like the videos and we engage, post them a little bit more comfortable with it. Uh, Absolutely. Post more frequently. So, yeah. Instagram's like a lifestyle, which is why I feel like a lot of people not struggle with it, but it's hard because like, a lot of it's like in the moment. So like you don't get as much time to like script it and plan it. Like you're kind of just there taking photos and, you know, like little videos and stuff. But I think that's why people like it because it's like more organic and like in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. All right. So, yeah, this is actually something like important about the value thing. And Alex actually just touched on that, that this, um, idea of posting on social isn't just about you there to like start up a platform for you to just start like sharing stuff with everyone and expecting them to just give you money it's also this idea that like you need to give something in order to get so um whether that's like like me like i host a lot of free trainings i do a lot of like free education i have a lot of free giveaways and books and resources that i provide to the public for free it's, it's really not that I'm expecting anything out of it. It's just this idea that like, you, you know, I'm showcasing my expertise to my audience, number one. And also like it shows that like your brand has a purpose and has a meaning. Now, if out of that, my JV partners are like, wow, she's so great and knowledgeable. And we love all this content she's putting out. We really want to talk with her. Great. But at the end of the day, like this is like the new way of being on social. You can't just go and start posting about all your deals and all the stuff you're doing. If all you're doing is just showcasing, but never actually giving any content or value to your audience. Um, they really don't have much reason to engage back with you. So I definitely encourage like if you guys are posting on social and you're feeling you're not getting a lot of traction, this could kind of be like the golden ticket that you're missing out of your profile is actually giving things away. And I don't mean like actually physical things, that could just be information, value, just something like for free that you give to people. So they feel like they want to keep coming back and that they're getting something out of you. Very, very good point. Very yeah. good point. Absolutely. Uh, coming from contribution, I think is one of the most underrated things ever. Absolutely. And it, it, I think it keeps us like grounded a little bit too, right? It's like we work a lot in like numbers and capital and things like that. And I think the more that we engage with our community and provide something to them, um, it kind of just forms like a beautiful circle of everyone kind of like helping everyone else out. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like a nice kind of kind of thing to build for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I always put the slide in like just for fun that I tell you guys to just do it. Like I hear so many excuses from people. Well, Sarah, I work a nine to five and I work, you know, so many hours and like, Hey guys, like, so did I, like, I, I wasn't just automatically like a full-time real estate investor. Like I had like a 50 hour a week job and I still made time to like post on social. I still made time to go see properties on weekends. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying it's fun, but if you guys really, really do want to raise capital and be taken seriously like you have to get serious about this and you have to just do it maybe you're not perfect yet maybe you're a little shy on camera and you don't really know what to say on video i was too 
if you guys want a good laugh, like go on my YouTube channel and watch my very first videos from like two years ago. I was so awkward and my lighting was terrible. I had no clue what I was doing, but I took this advice. I just did it. I knew I had to get started somewhere. We all have to start somewhere. So get out there, start on a couple social channels, just get, you know, YouTube, Instagram, whatever you're comfortable with, get that logo, get that website and just put yourself out there at some point you're going to have to do it um, and just rip the bandaid off. You got to start. hundred percent. You know, it's a good point too, though. It's uh, for those <coughs> of you guys watching, maybe you guys really like your career. Maybe you don't want to be a, a professional full-time real estate Absolutely. investor. Like, uh, I think that's okay. In, in my opinion, it's totally when it fine. To, when it comes yeah. to investing, I think that uh, investing, like the way I would teach my children is it's not, uh, you can do whatever you want. If you want to, you know, go into art or whatever, you have to obviously be able to support yourself. Um, but investing is almost a non-negotiable is because it's something that's, it's gotta be a part of your everyday life. It's almost like, have you ever read the richest man in Babylon? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's, you're supposed to save, you're supposed to invest, you're supposed to earn a certain amount. And they, 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 draw an even distribution of what that would look like. And I think that in, a lot of people think that investing is like this extracurricular activity that they're just going to do and they just can't do it. Whereas I think that in order to get ahead, you you, you'll never be able to save just to get to retirement. You just to, yeah. It just does not work. You cannot save to become wealthy. You have to be able to invest your money wisely. And that's why whether or not you become the real estate expert or you become the joint venture partner, it doesn't matter as long as you can take investing to, to a level where you actually start to implement it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, like, you know, not everybody, like you said, like has to just give up their whole career if they love it and, and become a full-time investor. But to your point, I mean, like retirement often seems almost unattainable like just by saving and buying a couple properties here and there like it can it can be pretty challenging to you know just kind of go on your own um steam alone i mean we all get capped out of the bank eventually yeah. so um no i think that's that's a really really good point to bring up and um yeah i mean if you guys like realistically you, you don't want to have a 50 door portfolio i mean you know, you don't have to wake up at 6 a.m. and start posting on social media. Um, but that being said, like, even if you want to attend doors, you know, you might not even be able to do that, you know, under your own qualification. Um, and still being, you know, a professional investor, whether you're kind of a hobbyist or not, um, it just, you know, adds more value to a portfolio, whether you're a pro and doing it full time or just kind of, you know, part time doing it with a corporate job on the side. So, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, I just want to give you guys like a few tips if you're kind of nervous about getting started. Cause I know I, I get a lot of these um, kind of like caveats. People are like, well, I don't have an expensive setup and I don't have a green screen and I don't have a nice camera to do a YouTube channel. It's fine. Guys, when I first started, like I, I used my phone, you know, when I was doing my YouTube videos, <clears throat> I edited it myself on my laptop uh, with a free software. So it's fine. And people still watch, you know, people like love my videos because the content was good. So you guys are going to focus on anything. Don't focus on the lighting and all the fancy like gizmos. Just focus on the content and actually put out something of value. So you should be trying to post at least like five days a week. I know that seems insane for a lot of people. That's what you got to do. Facebook is never going to rank your information properly um, if you aren't posting consistently. So you got to do it between three to five days a week. Mm -hmm. Try to do like at least one video a week, I would say. Um, and always try to be educational and informative. Um, that's just something I always like recommend in general. Like the more you talk about how great you are and how many properties you've invested in, you kind of get the wrong vibe. Um, it's better, you know, again, you want to take this idea of, providing value, give things away, show a collaboration like with your audience and, you know, try to be a little more educational and informative. Um, you'll definitely get a lot further with your um, stuff. And that being said, this is like my, always my, my last slide for people. It's this idea that like there has to be a call to action to what you do. And this is where most people actually struggle with their socials or Sarah, I have been on Facebook for a year. I post all the right things. 
you know, I do all of this stuff. I, I put up the videos, I put up the content. What am I doing wrong? I'm not getting JVs reach out to me. It's probably because you aren't talking enough about the fact that you are looking for JVs, that you work with JVs and giving them a reason to reach out to you. So I know this sounds super silly guys, but honestly, like people online need to be like led by the hand, like paint by numbers. If you want them to call you, if you want them to reach out to you, you need to actually say, call me. Here's this link you can like click on. <laughs> Book a phone call, reach out to me, invest in this deal with me, whatever the case is. Otherwise people are just gonna say, oh, it's a nice post and just keep <laughs> scrolling, you know? Like you literally have to make it like idiot proof <laughs> for people. Um, because like I said, like um, as much as like, okay, maybe we're a little more interactive on Instagram, for the most part, we are actually fairly passive on social media when we're scrolling. So you really have to like give someone a reason to stop, click, and actually take what you're saying seriously. So always, always, always make sure like you guys use some sort of call to action. Even if it's like, hey, so like we just like bought this deal with my part JV partners. It's such a great deal. We're going to be netting like, you know, 40% ROI, super excited for them. We have another deal in the pipeline. If you want to get on my list, or join us on the next one, you know, book a call with us here or reach out to my email here. It sounds super simple and silly, um, but without letting people know that you're looking for partners and giving them a reason to reach out to you, they probably won't. So you gotta get like kind of crafty with those calls to action. That's a very, very good point. It's so funny that that something so simple is something that I know I've personally missed so many times. Yeah. Like I'll post this very cool video. I think I'm, you know, adding value. I'm being informative and I'm like, see ya. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the heck's the point of that, you know? But anyway, that's, you're uh, like, shoot, I should have been like, I make sure to email me at this. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> I've done that too. Absolutely. Cause sometimes it feels like inauthentic to be what we consider salesy. And you know, what I find really funny is like, so I used to do sales training in my previous corporate life and most people think that they're being more salesy than they actually are. And some people come to me and they're like, oh my God, I can't say that, Sarah. Like, how can I say that? They're gonna think I'm just like this like horrible like vacuum like salesman. And I'm like, no, like, trust me, like you don't sound salesy at all. But I think like sometimes we feel like almost like embarrassed that we're asking people for capital or that we feel like we're like desperate, like, you know, using people's money to invest in real estate. And it, guys, it's, it's honestly it's just a mindset thing. You do not sound salesy. Like you are literally providing someone with something that they are already interested in. Like they want to hear about the deal. They want to hear about how you're going to make their life better. Otherwise they would not have clicked on your link. They would not be following your Facebook page if they didn't want to hear from you. So when you think you're being too salesy, Again, you're probably not, so don't feel like you shouldn't promote yourself online. Yeah, don't let it cease you from taking action. Because that's the the, the fundamental yeah. underlining premise, I think, here too, right? You just gotta take action. You gotta like take some risks. Sometimes you feel a bit embarrassed and you're like, why did I post that online? Um, better that though than you know, you not posting at all or not taking any risks. So this is kind of like advanced strategy for you guys. Um, obviously, like start small, walk before you run. Not saying you have to start this stuff today, um, but this is definitely some extra stuff that can kind of like boost up your following, get a little more interested. You know, are people that are like interested in your stuff specifically? Things like Facebook ads. You know, it's cool that people, you know, you might have like 300 people following your page, but better if you can boost some content on a Facebook ad and get like 3,000 people looking at it or more. Um, stuff like Instagram stories and hashtags, you know, make sure you're hashtagging your stuff so people can search for it. Make sure you're posting on Insta stories. A lot of people nowadays barely go on each other's like walls anymore. Most people are following people's stories. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to like make sure you're snapping little videos and pictures throughout the day um, and funnels in order to get contact information from people. I mean, everyone just has this like negative opinion of click funnels. Like they're like, oh, it's clickbait. We, you know, feel it's so like authentic, inauthentic. Um, but honestly, like it's such a great way to get people's information. It's like you do a webinar or you do a training, you get people's information, you talk about content that they're interested in, they get into like an email list that you have, and you know, boom, you you pr keep providing them with information. Um, that's actually one of the the biggest um successes I've had um in my portfolio is email marketing, which people think is like a dead 
avenue. Um, but my email marketing, like my newsletter is probably one of the most successful pieces that I have in my JB funnel. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I took a course on that, by the way, that was like, I know a lot of people, you know, they're like, Oh, what do I write in my emails? I actually took a course um, because I just, I was so lost about like writing an email is very different than writing like, a Facebook post or even an essay, you know, there's kind of like a science to email marketing. Um, so I definitely suggest like do some research and consider actually starting a newsletter, like an online one. Um, so you, do you create your own newsletters? I do. I could oh. outsource them, but I, I enjoy writing and I sometimes fear that if I outsource everything to marketing agencies that I start to like lose my voice, yeah, you know, like point. I want stuff to still sound like it like comes from me. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a very interesting point. I like that. Yeah. Some of my stuff, like my Facebook ads and some of my other stuff, I do have like a digital agency that handles that. Um, but my, my email uh, list, I actually do that all myself. Very, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, guys, this is, you know, one of those things I know this is really far outside of a lot of people's comfort zones when it comes to raising capital. Um, that's kind of like the new age. I mean, like COVID showed us if anything that sometimes like social interaction in person isn't even possible. And so we kind of have to keep up with the times, you know, get a little out there and start posting on social. You're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotten, they say. So uh, definitely move with the times. I like it. I like it a yeah. lot. <laughs> no. Well, listen, Sarah, like we, we actually, it's an hour and uh, six minutes, um, I'm which is sorry. incredible that, that, no, no, don't be sorry at all. I think it's, it's incredible when time flies, especially in these, yeah. in these meetings, because I find it personally very engaging. I know a lot of people who watch it, I get a lot of feedback. I was like, wow, yeah. I got a great couple of tidbits from this. And, and that's what it's all about. At the end of the yeah. day, it's about adding value to the viewers. And it's about um, adding value to you too. I mean, being a guest here. So from, uh, from the whole game community, thank you so much for a little bit of time with us. And, uh, and where can people find you? Well, if you guys want my handle, because I'm actually on social pretty much all day long, probably the best place to reach me, you guys can follow me at Sarah Etter Invest. At Sarah Etter Invest. And what's your website too? You um, it's just sarahetter.com. Sarahetter.com. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, cheers to your continued success. You're a uh, force you. to be reckoned with, and I'm really excited to, uh, to follow you through the journey. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.